Welcome back to our study of Colossians. This is session five, and what we're doing in this study is we're just really walking through this letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians, and we're trying to discern what truth we can hear, what word of God that we can hear as we pay close attention to the words that were written so long ago. And and what I've suggested to you throughout is that Colossians really is a call to continue in Christ alone. It is a call to celebrate and live in and from and out of the sufficiency of Jesus, to believe that Jesus really is enough. It was written to a group of people who thought Jesus was great, but wondered if they needed something more. And Paul says, trust me, trust me, trust me. What you need to understand is that Jesus provides you with everything you need. And uh, we eventually are going to get to Paul's answer to the question of, okay, so how do I access? How do I obtain all that is supposedly available to me in Jesus? We'll get to the how question, but Paul really spends the first portion of this letter answering the why question. I mean, he's most interested in making sure and drilling down and making all sorts of arguments for why we should stick with Jesus, why we should trust that he and he alone is enough. And just by way of review, one of the things that we noticed he said right off the top was, and I'll just write this one word, remember, um, he said, I want you to, first of all, remember all that God has done for you and is doing in you and where he is taking you. Paul understands that just like the Israelites were delivered from slavery and then kind of got hard along the way, and so they thought maybe we should just go back, he recognizes that once you say yes to Jesus, maybe you think everything is all of a sudden just going to fix itself, and it doesn't, and its progress is slow, and you want to do something, you want to be something, and so you think maybe I need something other than this path. And Paul, first of all, says, whoa, 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 remember where you've been. You forget, you're forgetting what God has already done for you, and who he has made you, and where he has taken you, and that's the first thing. The second Um, piece that we looked at is in chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, where Paul really just, it's, I think this is, in many ways, itself the argument that you have here, um, a statement of the supremacy of Jesus, that Jesus is supreme in in creating all things and in reconciling all things, and, and no one else actually can compete with what it is that Jesus does because of who Jesus is, and so you have the supremacy of Christ as a reason to stick with him. And then after that, we looked at um, this in the last session, chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. We examined the necessity of faith. What Paul does in that section is he says, yeah, no, it's really real that once you were alienated with God from God because of your own wrong thinking and, and wrongdoing, and, and yet Christ has, 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 joined, has come in a physical body and he's died so that now you're free from accusation because his death was actually for you in your place and, and you can have peace with God and this extends throughout the world if if you continue in faith. And so that was the piece that we looked at. And we examined a couple of theological things. We looked at universalism, which I regard as a real problem and a real mistake and a real temptation. One I understand, but I don't think it's a Christian understanding of things. And I think that this is one of the many passages that shows us, uh, whereas we may not want to, you know, have have an idea of God that feels mean or judgmental. And that's perfectly fine to want the world to desire our God. But there's a point at which we have to recognize that God isn't always going to seem appealing to the world because God doesn't play by anybody else's rules. And so the scriptures guide us in our thoughts in this regard, and they suggest to us that universalism is actually not the proper way to understand the future. And then we also looked at Calvinism, which is, again, very different, but a little bit more of a disagreement among those who agree on all of the basic essentials. At any rate, we we focused in on looking at the, I'm going to add my a little E right there so you can understand the word I mean. The necessity of faith is, is what was at, at stake there. And then in this section that we're looking at today, chapter 1, 24 through 2, 5, uh, Paul actually talks about himself a little bit, and he offers as a reason to continue trusting Jesus his own reliability. Um, He recognizes that he is an apostle, and so he realizes that a lot of times what people think of him is going to, in large part, determine what they think of Jesus. And that's, that's why Paul talks about himself. That's how this particular section fits into the argument that Paul is, is, is presenting here. He wants to make sure that you understand where he's coming from. And so he stresses his reliability because he knows that for some he might get in the way. And that was true then and this is true now. I've had friends who've walked away from the Lord and step one was saying something like, well, I can trust in Jesus. I just don't know about this Paul guy. And honestly, generally speaking, those people tend to end up walking away from the whole thing or redefining it so much that it's not even the same thing. I read a book one time called Atheist Manifesto by a really intelligent atheist. And and, uh, I mean, he didn't say a lot about Paul, but what he said wasn't very nice. And and so Paul knows then and now that he kind of stands in the way of faith. And so he wants to clarify where he's coming from. 
um, in, in your understanding of, of, of who Jesus is and how he saved the world. So I want to, uh, want to read this passage uh, with you. And this is another one of those that actually kind of like 1, 15 through 20 has, I think, a very specific structure that's helpful for understanding the primary point that Paul wants to make. So let's read through. He says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the, pe- to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So once more, if I could, I'd like to draw your attention to the structure of uh, what Paul seems to be saying here. And um, similar to what we saw in uh, in 1, 15 through 20, this is a type of um, a type of writing, you could again call it poetry, that's fine, that is sort of like our poetic structures, but a little bit different. You know, our poems usually rhyme roses or red, violets or blue, those sorts of things. But you all learned in po- poetry class about the ABBA structure. You know, you have a line, maybe usually that rhymes in, um, uh, I like when it is gray, and then uh, you have a couple other lines, um, I feel so mellow, I really love yellow, let's go out and play. And so you have like the first and the last line match and the middle two lines match. That's something like what I think Paul's doing here, but it's less about rhyming and it's more about content. So we think, um, and I'm just gonna write some key words and, and then you can look at your text to notice, uh, really I'll kind of fill it out a little bit. Paul starts this by talking about how he rejoices. That's uh, one of the first words in here. And he rejoices specifically in his suffering for them. That's how, that's how we begin this. Um, Paul is very clear. Like I, what was he I rejoice in what I am suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction. So he rejoices in his suffering for them. Then at the very end, once again, we see him uh, rejoicing. So at the end, he actually rejoices in their growth apart from him. He says um, here in this last verse, though I'm absent from you in body, I'm present with you in spirit and delight, rejoice to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So he starts by rejoicing in his suffering for them. Then he rejoices in their growth apart from him. Uh, in, in, the, in the next section up top, he talks about Jesus using two key terms, mystery and wisdom. So he suggests that um, that the mystery of God is unfolded. Now that's a really important word because it probably doesn't mean what we tend to think in the English language. We tend to think of mystery as something that can't be understood. No, the, the Greek word mysterion means something more like a secret that you now know. So mystery, in at least Paul's writing, refers to something that wouldn't be known if it wouldn't wasn't revealed by the one who knew it. And in this case, something about God's plan that we wouldn't have known, but now we've realized it. So what Paul is saying when he talks about Jesus as the mystery is that Jesus is actually the the conclusion to the Old Testament story that we didn't even know we were looking for. But now that he's come, we can see it. And that's a really exciting thing if you've been waiting for centuries upon centuries for the story to come to a conclusion. And then, of course, he talks about Jesus in terms of wisdom. He says that we proclaim Jesus, admonishing, teaching everyone with all wisdom. Um, Then again, down here in the, I think there's kind of five sections. That's the second section. In the fourth, you once again here talk about Jesus as mystery and wisdom. So later on down in um, in verse two, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so, of course, the point here is 
All of us are on a quest for wisdom, even if we don't frame it that way. All of us want to know what the good life is and how we can access it. And Paul uses that language of quest and, and a hunt for a hidden treasure. And he says that what you're looking for is wisdom and the place where you can find it is Jesus. And so we have all this like good truth on its own, but I think it's designed as part of a whole. So he rejoices in his suffering for them and he rejoices in their growth apart from him. Jesus is the mystery of God and we teach him with all wisdom. Jesus is the mystery of God in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. And in the middle, you actually have this verse 29. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. So in the end, what Paul says is, I labor for your maturity. And that, I think, is the centerpiece of what Paul is saying here. Again, Paul recognizes that he might be something of a hindrance for some, and he wants to make very clear that he's not in this for himself. Good heavens, he's got enough scars on his back that you should believe that he's in this for somebody else, and who he's actually in this for is you. And this was, of course, true of the Colossians, whom Paul never personally met, and it's true of us, whom Paul never personally met. People disagree, disagree on this to, to varying degrees, but I think Paul was very aware of the fact that these letters were a part of the purposes of God that stinted, extended beyond the initial recipients. That's why he told people to pass them around. And so Paul wants to say, as, as we recognize that our faith is in Jesus, but we rely on the apostles, Paul wants to say, you can trust us too, because we did our work, even to the point of suffering, for the sake of your maturity. So the primary point that Paul wants to make here is that another reason why you should believe in Jesus is that he entrusted his mission and his truth to apostles who faithfully move it forward on their behalf. I don't want to stop there, though. So maybe I'll give you just a second. Maybe I'll just filibuster here with my words for a moment to give you a second to kind of gather your, your mind and, and wrap your head around that because I actually want to say a couple more things. This is the primary point that Paul makes, but I think that we learn some other things in here as well. I'll make three statements about our work as an extension of Paul's work. I think one thing that we see here is that our work is unfinished yet glorious. One of the strangest statements that Paul makes is what he says in verse 24, I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. That passage bothers a lot of people because it makes it seem like Jesus' death wasn't sufficient for our salvation. I actually don't think it's super complicated. I think we kind of make it more complicated than it needs to be. There may be some relevant background information from Jewish circles, and Paul may be using some language from texts that he's read. But at the end of the day, I think the statement can be understood like this. It's like somebody made this marker and, um, and so, I don't know how they did this. They somehow put ink inside this thing in such a way that it comes out at an appropriate rate when you write on a board with it. Like, that wasn't me. Somebody else did that. And this marker was specifically designed for a purpose, to write on a board so that other people can see. Now, my script aside, you understand that the way in which this works is by me taking this thing that is complete in of itself. It lacks nothing with respect to the capability to write on a board. But what it requires is for somebody to pick it up and write with it. So I am filling up what is lacking with respect to this particular marker so that it can accomplish its purpose. That's maybe a really silly analogy, but hopefully you get my point. Christ, by dying for our sins and rising from the dead, has done everything that is necessary for our salvation. But we're not going to be saved unless the message gets out and we hear it and believe it. And so what Paul is saying is, in the same way that Jesus died in his body for you, don't forget he had just said that, man, I'm suffering in my flesh for you as well. And that's true for us. Our ministry is unfinished. There are more people who need to hear about Jesus, and yet it is also glorious because we declare the mystery of God and the wisdom of God. That's one thing. Second thing I want to say is that our work is clear and unchanging. Anytime you're trying to accomplish something, you want to ask important questions like, what are we trying to do and how are we going to do it? I think Paul gives us the answers here. And this isn't the only language that's used in Scripture by any means, but these are the realities that you don't get to mess with if you want to do the work of God. What are we trying to do? We're trying to bring about maturity, right? Like in Christ, he says, I labor uh, with everything in me for to present everyone fully mature in Christ. Maturity, growth, stability, perfection, not in the sense of not making any mistakes, but in the sense of rehabilitated to what it's supposed to be. So especially, man, if you guys are leaders in churches, remember from this text, be centered on the mission that you've been given to present everyone who comes under your care fully mature in Christ. That's what we're doing. And how do we do it? Paul tells us that as well. Verse 28, literally in the Greek, it says, him we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. 
So Jesus is the one that we talk about. That's how we do it. We speak Jesus again and again and again, and we admonish, which means we warn about directions that may be dangerous, and we instruct, which means we lay out the truth and describe what it means for our lives with all wisdom. So our work is uh, unfinished but glorious. Our work is clear and unchanging. And finally, our work is hard but worth it. Paul uses some strong language like labor and toil. Matter of fact, one of the words he uses here to describe his work is it actually means to be repeatedly hit in the head. It's a term from various contexts, including boxing. And uh, if you've tried to serve Jesus, maybe you get that, that it kind of just feels like you're getting hit again and again and again. And Paul says, listen, um, that's, that's what we're called to. And that's what's going to happen, but it's worth it. Because in only this do we extend the message of life to the world. And as we go about this, Jesus actually proves that he's enough. And honestly, I'm almost done, but let me share one more thing with you. This to me has been one of the most important passages at important seasons of my life when I was very tired and I wasn't sure I had anything left in the tank to provide for anybody else. You know how people talk sometimes about how you should memorize scripture because occasionally the Holy Spirit will draw it to your attention? Well, that doesn't always happen for me, but sometimes it does, and it's often this passage. And it's a silly story, but even as I read the text, I think about this moment not too long ago, probably within the last year or two. Um, I had an event to go to, and I needed to sort of be on and kind and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, needed to be a bit of a host in, in that context, a leader, and I didn't want to go. I had, I had no energy left, and it was an optional thing for me, but some of my other friends and family wanted to go, and so I'm going, and I remember driving to this event, and I'm talking to Jesus as I'm driving down the highway, and I'm like, listen, Jesus, I got nothing left in the tank, and if you don't come through for me, I know what kind of mood I'm in, and I'm sorry, but I'm telling you, I'm gonna make this miserable for my family. I'm gonna make it miserable for everybody I come into contact with. I don't even think I can fake it. And as I'm saying these words, I didn't hear a voice, but it's like Jesus said to me, uh, yeah, you don't have to, because it's not on you. And my attention was drawn to this passage in Colossians chapter one. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully energizes in me. And he said to me, I've got energy to spare and you're doing what I want you to do. So just lean in and let me handle it. And it doesn't always go that smoothly, but on this occasion, I leaned in and he did. I didn't change anybody's life in dramatic ways that night, but I wasn't a jerk. And sometimes that's a positive thing. So what Paul is saying in this passage is, you got a lot of reasons to trust in Jesus. One of them is the reliability of Paul and the other apostles. And in the process, we learn some important things about the work that we also ourselves are called to do.